Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and we are back for news and politics for the day and this is for the Friday, December the 1st, 2023. Now, first thing we're going to look at is an article from ProPublica. West Virginians could get stuck cleaning up the coal industry's messes. The state's program for reclaiming abandoned coal mines has long been plagued with problems, but state and federal officials have done little to prepare for this reckoning. Yeah. And, yeah, when basically a coal company is done with a mine, it's called reclamation, so yeah. They're reclaiming the land. But often they, they are left looking like this. With the scratches and everything on the land. Scarred. Rock walls. I guarantee you this land was originally nothing like this before it was used to hunt down coal. This is an excavated mountain and high walls on the western side of the Twilight Mining Complex owned by the Lexington Coal Company in Lindytown, West Virginia. So yeah, like I said... I've seen these all over the place. You see land like this here and there. It's just devastating. West Virginia's fund to clean up abandoned coal mines is in such dire shape that it threatens to stick taxpayers with hundreds of millions, perhaps even billions of dollars in cleanup costs. And yet, little was being done to turn things around. I think coal companies should be the ones responsible for cleaning up. The bankruptcy of just one significant mining company could wipe out the fund, according to the state's top regulatory official. And auditors for the Republican-controlled legislature said at least five major companies were at risk of dumping cleanup costs on the state. trying to return the land back to usage and decent status after your coal company tore through it should be part of the coal company's responsibility. Not the state. Not the federal. It should be on the coal company. They're the ones that did the damage, they should be the ones charged with the cleanup. At 15 million, the state's fund for restoring land is at its lowest level in more than 20 years. The program's latest published actual actuarial report in 2022 warned that a related water cleanup trust fund will lose half its balance over the next 10 years. These are the costs the coal industry was supposed to cover. Unreclaimed mine sites can not only damage the environment, but they also endanger your coal field residents who live nearby. Coal waste claims sometimes, or coal waste dams sometimes leak or break, flooding downstream communities. Cliffs of rock and debris left behind after mining can collapse. Runoff that isn't contained or treated often poisons fish or water supplies. You'll often see 
signs that say watch for falling rocks if you're driving along a road that's beside a high wall where the land has just kind of been sheared away. Yeah. This crisis is emerging in other coal states like Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, which have also had problems with their mine reclamation programs. But West Virginia offers perhaps the clearest and most troubling portrait of what could happen as the coal industry's decline continues. The state funds problems have been depicted as a recent phenomenon tied to a wave of coal company bankruptcies over the past decade. But a detailed review by Mountain State Spotlight and ProPublica reveals that they are far from that. State and federal officials have been warned repeatedly over the past 40 years that this reckoning was coming but have failed to prepare for it. Again and again, the review found auditors questioned whether West Virginia's reclamation program would have adequate funding. But neither state lawmakers nor regulators required coal companies to have enough reclamation bonds as insurance should they go belly up, nor did legislatures raise the tax on coal production enough to make up the difference. Federal officials in both Republican and Democratic administrations who were supposed to oversee the state's program cautioned they were problems but didn't step in. Yeah. This desire to hunt for the black diamond, aka Co, has done a lot of damage. That's why one of the things that helped Trump, especially in these areas, coal country was on the decline. And he said, I'll bring, I'll bring jobs back to coal country. Coal miners will be back to work in no time. Nope. Nope. Just like everything else, he's full of shit. Anyway, let's head on to the next article here. Ah, we have a piece uh, question here for Ask Historians. Why did we invade Afghanistan after 9-11? Of the hijackers that did 9-11, 15 of them were from Saudi Arabia and several of them had connections to the Saudi government. Why did we go to Afghanistan and not Saudi Arabia? I just want to let you know that I'm 17, meaning I was born after 9-11 happened, so I don't know that much about the political climate around the time. Okay, here's what went on. Saudi Arabia, yes, it had the great majority of the hijackers. And most, a good number of the hijackers had connections to the Saudi royal family. But, Saudi Arabia, Arabia is allies with the U.S. 
you can see this back years and years. We should have went after Saudi Arabia, but they were so cozy to those in power that that wasn't going to happen. No. It wasn't bound to happen at all. Afghanistan, on the other hand, very, very much not wealthy, not powerful. And there are there were suggestions thrown around, oh, that's where bin Laden was hiding. He was in the caves in Afghanistan. We sure didn't find him. Not in Afghanistan. We sure didn't find him there. Not in Afghanistan. But something Afghanistan also had was valuable commodities. You see, Afghanistan is one of the top providers of poppies, which are used to produce opium, heroin, um, other drugs of that form that are born out of the poppy plants and they are high level painkillers I mean today the drugs we have the mo most problem with that are prescription drugs <laughs> opiates guess where they are, are originate from poppies Yeah. So it did provide some of its own resources that we could make a profit on. And because America was in such a frenzy of we must get bin Laden, we immediately... For some reason, most people immediately agreed, let's get into Afghanistan and get them. Yeah. We were told, like I said, he, we were told he was in the caves. Turns out, ten years later, we would get him, but it wasn't in Afghanistan. It was in Pakistan, if I remember right. We should have been only in Afghanistan, if there at all, for a couple years just to scour the country. But... We ended up being there for 20 years for what exactly? What what did what what was the what what did we get out of uh, being in Afghanistan for 20 years? Pretty much nothing. Pretty much nothing. And then, of course, we went into Iraq. I heavily questioned that. I'm like, 
But 9-11 hijackers would never be on the same side as Saddam Hussein. We know this. I believe they were different forms of um, Islam, if I remember right. Saddam would have never let them in, but at that point, there was such a hunger. You know, it's like, we can go in and take what we want. Because we'd been in Afghanistan at that point for a couple years now, and it's like, let's go in and attack Iraq too. And again, that was for what? As much as we may not have liked Saddam Hussein, he kept order in Iraq. Both wars, though, it accomplished nothing. It was all for the military-industrial complex. Those companies that make big money making machines of war and ammunition. Yeah. It was disgusting. But yeah, I'll, again, I'll post this so you can read through it if you want. They should have, they have a lot more information in depth. But it was stupid. Okay, here's a pic mugshot of an 11 year old Anton Wood before the juvenile court system was in place youngsters were sent to adult prisons in 1893 it happened to 11 year old Anton Wood who was convicted of murder in 1893 so yeah, 11 year old boy sent to prison for murder as an adult. Now of course we have the juvenile justice system. And someone like him would be sent uh, through the juvenile system instead. But yeah, at that time before 1900, he was just sent straight into Big time jail. And again, people keep saying, oh, everything's going so bad uh, the more time goes by. This was 1893. 1893, an 11-year-old committing murder. Don't tell me this crap of, oh, the world's getting worse. No. The world's what it always has been. We're just exposed to stuff much quicker because most of us are on our screens. One of the reasons I don't own a cell phone because I don't want all that crap. Shopping at Kroger, Kroger Supermarket in Lexington, Kentucky in 1947. Yeah, Kroger stores. Look, look at all the lines and the people. You can see them lined up here, back through here. They got the different checkout, but still it's like there's a lot of people. Another good image here. The Northern Lights, as seen from the International Space Station. Yeah. Look at the image here. This is wild. This is what the Northern Lights look like from above. Yeah. 
From CNBC, we get into some actual news here. Sandra Day O'Connor, first woman on the Supreme Court, has died. She was 93. She was the first sup uh, female Supreme Court justice. Um, she was nominated by President Ronald Reagan in 81. Was Yeah, first woman, I've already said that. The court said that O'Connor died of complications related to advanced dementia, probably Alzheimer's and a respiratory illness. Just five other women have served on the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died in 2020, and current justices Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Amy Coney Barrett, and Ketanji Brown Jackson. So right now, we've got four of the women out of the six who have ever served on the Supreme Court on the court. Yeah. Here's something I found very, very interesting. From the AP, Mexico's minimum wage will rise by 20% next year to about fourteen twenty-five per day. Yet in America, the federal minimum wage is still seven and a quarter. You know, we're getting beat out by so many countries, it's about time to move to other countries to find fucking work. Because America sure ain't taking care of its workers. This is from NPR. Israel resumes airstrikes after it says Hamas violated the truce. Here's y'all some prisoner exchanges. Now we're going to bomb you to death. Again. Israel's warplanes began pounding targets in Gaza early Friday, shortly after the collapse of a ceasefire deal that had allowed the release of more than 100 hostages seized by Hamas militants and nearly 250 Palestinians from Israel jails. By mid-afternoon, Israel had already launched more than 200 airstrikes across the territory, the Israeli military said, including the Rafa and Khan Yunus. The South's two largest cities were hundreds of thousands of of Palestinians from the north have sought shelter. This is quite literally like the saying, shooting fish in a barrel. They have all the Palestinians trapped in there and they're just ceaselessly bombing, murder, genocide, holocaust. This is from Times Union. Tai in wall kill supervisor election could be con could be decided by two contested ballots. Both candidates dispute ballots during a hand recount that could tip the election. Yeah, this is an election so close. It's just a hand... It's literally single digits in voting. Voters are told every election cycle that every vote counts. That is rarely literally true. But in the case of this year's wall kill supervisor race, it is. The election night Three weeks ago, Democratic Councilman 
Neil Meyer appeared to have a slight edge over Republican incumbent supervisor George Serrano. But weeks later, after the Orange County Board of Elections finished counting many outstanding ballots, the final tabulation showed a dead even vote. Not 1,910 to 1,910. Yeah. That triggered an automatic recanvas, which was conducted at the Board of Elections in Goshen on Tuesday. The result of the by-hand recount nearly matched the initial outcome, 1,908 for Mayer, 1,910 for Serrano. But it's not over just yet. Three ballots were put aside and are being contested by both parties. Orange County Board of Elections Commissioners Courtney Canfield Green and Luis Vandemark told the Times Union. Serrano is contesting one ballot claimed by Myers' campaign. Meyer is contesting one claim by Serrano's campaign that has not yet been counted for either candidate. The third ballot indicates a vote for Meyer but also has a tear. Serrano is not challenging that ballot. So yeah. <laughs> this, this is literally every vote count situation. We can't say 100% that somebody won yet until these three ballots are put back or there's a determination on them. Whoo! This, 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 this is interesting. This is one of those situations, quite literally, where it's like, go vote. This is what I try to tell people with other elections. Even if you don't like the people who are running, go vote. It's, it's something we can do that other countries can't. And sometimes, even though it don't feel like it, your vote can matter. Look at it right here. You know, it, it, it's off. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. It's why you should always, if you have the t opportunity, go vote. It's a right many do not have. So, All right. From political discussion, should the thoughts and opinions of the Founding Fathers affect current U.S. politics? There seems to be a lot of discussion behind this in politics. What exactly the Founding Fathers meant when they wrote the Constitution. Should this even matter? They lived in a time with completely different morals. Yeah. Other countries have wrote multiple new constitutions since we wrote this one 200 200 plus years ago yeah i think we're coming up on 250 1776 is freedom. 1791 to 1991 was 100 years. So we're looking at 230 plus years. The Constitution has been around. So 
like I said, because the original was written in 1791. But other countries have already made several with, because they feel there's always needs to redo them. Uh, I think the thoughts and opinions of the founders can be useful in certain contexts, but aren't ironclad. Example, people who claim the founders intended for the country to be founded as a Christian nation can be proved wrong by pointing to the writings of from Thomas Jefferson, including the Treaty of Tripoli, which explicitly stated the U.S. was not founded as a Christian country. His letter to the Danbury Baptist when he was U.S. President also shows this. Here's another good example from Thomas Jefferson in a letter he wrote in 1824 to John Cartwright. The context here is important, I think. By 1824, Jefferson was an old man, 81 years of age. He hadn't served in government for 16 years, and the Constitution had been in place for long enough that he'd gotten to see how it was playing out. Here he talks about whether it should be made unchangeable. But can they, they meaning constitutions, be made unchangeable? Can one generation find another and all others in succession or ever? I think not. The Creator was made has made the earth for the living, not the dead. Rights and powers can only belong to the persons, not the things, not to mere matter, unendowed with will. The dead are not even things. The particles of matter which compose their bodies make part now of the bodies of other animals, vegetables, or minerals of a thousand forms. To what, then, are attached the rights and power they held while in the form of men? A generation may bind itself as long as its majority continues in life. When that has disappeared, another majority is in its place holds all the rights and powers their predecessors once held and may change their laws and institutions to suit themselves. Nothing, then, is unchangeable about the inherent and unalienable rights of man. Of course, the wrinkle in this passage is that Jefferson see seems to be referring to the amendment process, but he goes on to discuss judicial usurpation of legislative power, and I think the implication is that courts cannot establish essentially permanent interpretations of constitutional provisions. So, it's a bit challenging to speculate on what Jefferson really thought. On the one hand, I don't think Jefferson would support the current version of originalism, which really leads to one generation binding another. But I'm also not sure he would agree with jurisprudential philosophy that broadly establishes unenumerated constitutional rights, since he likely thought that was better situated in the legislature. But it's also important to note that Jefferson was so worried was so worried about unchangeable laws resulting in one generation binding another that when they were writing the Constitution, he wanted to make sure that the Constitution would expire and be rewritten every 19 years. Here's Jefferson again in a 1789 letter to James Madison. This would have been uh, this would have been when they were discussing potential ideas for a new constitution. 
On similar ground, it may be proved that no society can make a perpetual constitution or even a perpetual law. The earth belongs always to the living generation. They may manage it then and what proceeds from it as they please during their usufruct. They are masters, too, of their own persons, and consequently may govern them as they please. But persons and property make the sum of the objects in government. The constitution and the laws of their predecessors extinguished when their natural course of those who gave them being. This could preserve that being till it ceased to be itself, and no longer. Every constitution, then, and every law, naturally expires at the end of 19 years. If it be enforced longer, it is a, an act of force and not of right. But, of course, this idea did not make it into the Constitution, and instead they adopted the amendment process. It's an interesting problem because, on one hand, laws and the constitutions that govern them need to be sufficiently permanent to be reliable in the short term, but on the other hand, if they are unchangeable, they can serve to oppress future generations as society outgrows them. This was essentially Jefferson's and others' concern. Jefferson's writing in some ways doesn't give us clear insight. Also, I recognize the irony of relying on what the framers thought to determine whether we should read the Constitution based on the framers' intent. I don't think Jefferson would support a constitutional philosophy that overly relies on strict adherence to the framers' intent, but I also think Jefferson was wary of the courts and applied interpreted laws in a manner that contradicted legislative power. He voices support for the common law tradition, a slow evolution of laws based on the culturally determined concepts of equity but also restrained by legislative dictate. At the end of the day, the real problem is that I don't think the framers anticipated that changing the Constitution via the amendment process would turn out to be the insurmountable barrier that it has become. At least some of their writings on the amendment process seems to suggest they believed it would be, a, would be fairly regular. So yeah, we get a lot of other comments here, but yeah, um, the Constitution should always be able to be changed, amended. It shouldn't be a wave of a hand process that can be done, but it should be something that can happen. It's insane that we have, what, 27 amendments only, 10 of which were the first, were first added on there as the Bill of Rights. Yeah, it, it should be able to be changed much easier than it is. From the Texas Tribu Tribune, John Cornyn and Ted Cruz walk out of the U.S. Senate hearing as Democrats vote on Harlan Crow's subpoena. The Texas Republicans oppose subpoenaing, subpoenaing conservative donor Crow over his ties to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas casting it as a partisan attack. Really, guys? It sounds like me they're looking for justice. 
our Supreme Court members shouldn't be easily assuaged by the rich's ability to manipulate them with big gifts. But you're like, uh, this, this is a partisan attack. Oh my lord. <sighs> From Salon, Newsom humiliates DeSantis on Fox News for their debate. Yeah, California Governor Gavin Newsom not only stood up for his state, but made a great case for Joe Biden on Fox News. When Florida Governor Ron DeSantis agreed to debate California Governor Gavin Newsom, it's unlikely he knew his presidential campaign would be flailing to the extent it currently is. But he still should have thought twice. Whatever he thought was his political skills might be, he is terrible on the debate stage. He's managed to barely hold his own in the sad Trumpless GOP primary debates that have been dominated by his rival, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. But he did... De did, did himself no favors on Thursday night when he finally met with Newsom on Sean Hannity's Fox News show. Any Trump fans, which would include virtually all Fox News viewers, were primed to watch Newsom be humiliated. Trump spokesman Steve Chung either taking dictation from the boss or channeling him perfectly, put out his humdinger of a statement in advance of the event. Ron the Sanctimonious is acting more like a thirsty third-rate OnlyFans wannabe model than an actual presidential candidate. Instead of actually campaigning and trying to turn around his dismal poll numbers, the Sanctus is now so desperate for attention that he's debating a grade-A loser like Gavin Newsom. At that debate, Ron will flail his arms and bubble his head wildly, looking more like a San Francisco crackhead than a governor of California. This isn't a prediction. It's a spoiler. Hopefully for Ron, it's a, seal, a seated debate so he won't have to smash his foot into his high heels to look taller. But if not, he'll definitely be on a 12-inch step stool so he can peek right above the podium. Outs. That's harsh, even by Trump standards. Trump didn't personally weigh in, but he did post on his social media site, Trump Social. Hannity was much kinder to DeSantis than that, but it didn't help much. And DeSantis certainly couldn't help himself. The questions were all loaded with statistics in favor of DeSantis designed to put Newsom on the defensive. I don't think there is even one data point he presented that put Florida in a more negative light. So it was up to Newsom to provide context and correct the record, which he did so effectively. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, from what I understand, Newsom more or less won, though DeSantis made a couple points here and there. So either side can really go, hey, it's, you know, this side won or this side won. But all in all, I, it seems to be DeSantis come out more ahead, so... Yeah. Uh, all right. In this article, Ireland's first satellite launched into orbit from California. Hmm. Ireland's satellite launched from California. Interesting. Uh, what would you consider a represent? representative sample of a country in order to determine a national preference for something. This is from Statistics, Reddit slash Statistics. I don't 
use it too much, but it does have a few things every now and then you can find. Let me start by saying, <clears throat> I know nothing about the compilation of statistics. I am asking this question based on something I'm currently in discussion with another person about, and I need to understand how the statistical compilation and research base for that compilation works. I'm dealing with a discussion concerning future plans for the Netherlands to exit the European Union. A recent publication of the internet uh, sampled a base of 1,002 people in the Netherlands with regard to what they feel the EU means to them. I'm having this statistical information quoted to me as proof that most people in the Netherlands don't want to leave the EU. My problem is that out of a country of 17.6 million citizens, using a representative sample of only 1,002 people seems ridiculously low to be compiling a statistic intended to show general feeling across the country. Would it be the case that a respectable statistical analysis of such feelings would need a larger sample to have any weight, or is it literally just a pick and mix of people and you assemble what you think would be, in, be believable? Your comments and help would be warmly appreciated. This is obviously a question, but since I've never posted to this sub before, I wasn't sure whether to add it as a, as a question or as research. Hopefully I've done this right. Thank you. Let's see. No, you were incorrect. A thousand is sufficient to make such a statement if they choose a randomized representative sample. Most of the times in stats, uh, if the sample isn't a ridiculously low number, let's say 10 people in your example, what you should be worried about is how representative the sample and unbiased the sampling is, not the number in and of itself. Let's say you, uh, you should be asking yourself, was the selection of people completely randomized? Did the citizens of the place where the interview took place maybe have a specific reason to want to stay in the EU? Maybe some funds were given to them specifically for different reasons. I don't know. These are the questions you should be asking yourself. Representativeness is not about the size of the sample, but about who is in the sample. The problem is who is willing to answer these questions. It could be the case that people with a particular opinion are less willing to share it. Another problem is who is able to answer the questions. For example, it could be that people working full-time have less chance to do a survey than people who are not working full-time. You can also have problems related to who is invited to participate, are you really using a method where everyone in your population is potentially included? People will sometimes take a look at things like a demographic characteristics of their sample to see it if it is closely resembles the population and sometimes to overweight some people's responses if they are part of a group that was underrepresented, though that can have issues with it. Overall, sample size will determine your confidence intervals, but does not speak to representativeness. So yeah. Hmm. 
This is from the Kiev Post. Might be biased since it's a Ukraine paper, but we'll find out. Russian troops say they're starving. Sent to slaughter via new video. Recent estimates suggest that particularly resulting from so-called meat assaults on the Ukrainian stronghold of Adivka, Russian troops are now being killed at rates comparable to World War I. Yeah, if you know anything about how Russian troops suffered during both world wars, the casualties were massive. A new video shows Russian troops complaining that their commanders sent them to the slaughter and leave the wounded to rot rather than issue evacuation orders. We are abandoned. It looks so. Our command provides false information. The video shared on X, formerly known as Twitter, by Anton Gerashenko, advisor to Ukraine's interior ministry, shows a group of Russian soldiers sitting in cramped quarters and complaining about their commanders and their provisions. So, yeah. Both countries going through hell. Honestly. Alright, this is from Reuters. Swiss have frozen $8.8 .8 billion of Russian assets. Switzerland has frozen an estimated $7.7 .7 billion Swiss francs. Uh, e equaling $8.81 billion in financial assets belonging to Russians, the government said on Friday under sanctions designed to punish Moscow for its invasion of Ukraine. The figure, a provisional estimate, represented a slight increase from the 7.5 billion francs the Swiss government said it had blocked last year after the neutral country adopted U European Union sanctions. So, yeah. Like I said, both countries are struggling. And you, Russia, the troops, are getting sick of it. They don't want to be fighting in this war. And Rus average Russians are suffering because the government's had so much put on them as far as sanctions and stuff. But Putin is determined to continue. This also from Reuters. UN chief says ending fossil fuel fuel use is the only way to save the burning planet. United States Secretary General Antonio Guterres told world leaders on Friday that the burning of fossil fuels must be stopped outright and a reduction or abatement in their use would not be enough to stop global warming. We cannot save a burning planet with a fire hose of fossil fuels, Guterres said in a speech to the COP28 summit in Dubai. The 1.5 degree limit is only possible if we ultimately stop burning all fossil fuels, not reduce, not abate. He urged fossil fuel companies to invest in a transition to renewable energy sources and told governments to help by forcing that change, including through the use of windfall taxes on industry profits. I urge governments to help industry make the right choice by regulating, legislating, putting a fair price on carbon 
ending fossil fuel subsidies and adopting a windfall tax on profits. Yeah, we ain't getting that. The world is screwed, essentially. Yeah, it ain't gonna happen. Now, let's watch some videos here. This is an emotional video by UNICEF spokesman James Elder from a Gaza hospital. We can already hear the bombing and I'm at a hospital. There was a hit about 15, so, uh, 15 meters from here, the hospital. In action by those with influence is allowing the killing of children. This is a war on children. The ceasefire is over. We can already hear the bombing and I'm at a hospital. There was a hit about 50 metres from here. This is the biggest still functioning hospital in Gaza. It's at 200% capacity. Yes, this is a hospital. The health system here is overwhelmed. This hospital simply cannot take more children with the wounds of war. There are children everywhere. These children are sleeping. There was a bomb literally 50 metres from here. I cannot overstate how the capacity has been reduced of hospitals in the last seven weeks. We cannot see more children with the wounds of war, with the burns, with the shrapnel littering their body with the broken bones. Inaction by those with influence is allowing the killing of children. This is a war on children. Yep why I continue to point out this is a genocide even a holocaust if you want to call it that some people may not like it but unfortunately there's a lot of things you don't like in life that are true Okay, this protesters in Boston interrupt the city council to denounce their complicity in the Israeli genocide. The city sends a twenty million dollar twenty million dollars annually to the Israeli military. I mean, all I can say is civilly disrupt like that. It's not violent. It's civil disruption. Yeah. Sometimes you got to make a point. I did turn the volume off. Yeah, I did. Okay. Couldn't remember. Okay. 
Good old fashioned police racism. Officer to be retried in an inmate's death stood on the man's neck using full body weight. Coroner blamed the death on excited delirium. While well, five jurors found the officer guilty in the first trial. That's when five officers jumped on top of Rios, pinning him to the floor, tasing him, punching him in the head. And at one point, Cooper stood on top of Rios behind his neck using his full 250 pound weight. The jail video shows Rios turning blue and losing consciousness. He was then sent to the hospital and died seven days later. Former corrections officer charged with the death of an inmate going back on trial in this case. Mark Cooper will be retried for his role in Alex Rios's death. Cooper's first trial, if you remember, ended in a mistrial that was earlier this month. Medina Special Prosecutor Forrest Thompson has confirmed he will retry Cooper for the death of Alex Rios. Thompson says the original jury was split with five jurors finding Cooper guilty and seven felt he was not. First, before we show you the video, we want to warn you that it is graphic. This all stems from an incident back in September of 2019 at the Richland County Jail. Rios tried running when corrections officers opened up his cell door. That's when five officers jumped on top of Rios, pinning him to the floor, tasing him, punching him in the head, and at one point Cooper stood on top of Rios behind his neck using his full 250 pound weight. The jail video shows Rios turning blue and losing consciousness. He was then sent to the hospital and died seven days later. Thompson says he'll present the same evidence in the retrial, though he plans to reassess his strategy. He's also considering calling on an expert who can testify about police conduct. Thompson hopes an expert can explain to jurors that Cooper's actions not only violated jail policy, but were also reckless and illegal. Thompson says for now he plans to try Cooper on the same charges, but there's also a chance that he could add or change the charges, and if he does that, those charges will first have to go before a grand jury for approval. Thompson says he doesn't know when the new trial will begin. That all depends on the court's schedule, and of course, we'll let you know. Yeah. You know, this is why I believe police and prison guards should be put through military style training where they are able to combat easier. They don't have to reach for a damn gun. They don't have to use full force. And they need to be put through a complete level of training to understand, hey, we don't have to reach for weapons, we don't have to be overtly violent, only use enough for the situation that it recall, that it calls for. You should, shouldn't should always be first saying, let me hit you hard. No. Sometimes the situation don't call for that. Anyway. John Mearsheimer on why Zionists don't want to talk about pre-October 7th. When you have a disaster, and what happened on October 7th is a disaster, one of the first things that happens is that people begin to ask the question, how did this happen, right? What's the root cause of this problem? This is a disaster. We have to understand what caused it so that we can work to, uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. So we can work to shut it down and then make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. But once you start talking about the root causes, right, you end up talking about how Israel was created, right, 
And that means telling a story that is not pretty about how the Zionists conquered Palestine. Uh, and number two, it means talking about the occupation, right? It, it's not like uh, Hamas attacked on October 7th because there were just a bunch of anti-Semites who hated Jews and wanted to kill Jews. This is not, you know, Nazi Germany, right? This is directly related to the occupation and to what was going on inside of Gaza. And it's not in Israel's interest or the lobby's interest to have an open discourse about what the Israelis have been doing to the Palestinians since, I would say, roughly 1903 when the second Aliyah came to Israel uh, or came to what was then Palestine, right? You want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, this is not just over the one attack on October 7th. One of the things you see since the 1970s is uh, many Americans try peace uh, to many American presidents try to push for peace between Israel and Palestine. You know, there's always the Camp David peace accords uh, other presidents have always tried to help them form levels of peace. But, you know, this is something that goes back a long, long time. And Israel always, has always had more capability since they have returned to the region than Palestine ever had. And we don't want to talk about, from the lobby's point of view, the influence that the lobby has, right? Uh, it's better from the lobby's point of view if most Americans think that uh, American support of Israel is just done for all the right moral and strategic reasons, not because of the lobby. And when John Mearsheimer and Steve Walt come along and say, you have to understand that this special relationship is due in large part to the lobby's influence, that is not an argument that uh, people in the lobby want to hear. People in the lobby understand that if you have an open discourse, Israel will end up looking very bad, right? You don't want to talk about the occupation. You don't want to talk about how Israel was created. Yep. They slowly just took land and took land and took land. And now what had once been a fairly big amount of territory for Palestine when Israel was first created has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because the Israeli government backs the idea of what they call settlers. They're occupiers is what they are. They take the land, the homes. And it, it's not right. It is not right. And Palestinians could do little to nothing about it. United Auto Workers call for an immediate permanent ceasefire in Palestine and Israel. International has voted to join the call for a ceasefire. The UAW International is calling for an immediate, permanent ceasefire in Israel and Palestine so that we can get to the work of building a lasting peace, building social justice, and building a community, a global community of solidarity. That is what we've committed ourselves to, and that is as important as anything else that we're doing in this country in order to assure that workers and oppressed people and poor people across the world are on the path to winning the justice that they so deserve. So I'm here um, with you all 
I'm proud to stand with our fellow uh, union members from the postal workers, from UE. For so long we've been silent and we've been ignorant in the labor movement to this issue. And that time is over. Yeah. And I want to thank all the rank and file members who have made this happen. Well said. Well said. But we'll end this episode here. It's already been fairly long. We're sitting at yeah, over an hour. <laughs> uh, but, as always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tells you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll be putting links in the description box below the video. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.